And the accumulating data would suggest they have very different effects on patients. And that's going to be true for plasma, and that's going to be true for platelets. So I actually think in World War II they were correct, where they gave whole blood, fresh whole blood to patients that had been stored for up to less than 14 days. If you go and you approach the blood banking industry, particularly in the United States, and you say, well, we're going to have to have fresh whole blood available, and I want it warm fresh whole blood, in other words, less than 24 hours old, the fear that occurs is immense because there's not a system, there's not even a vision or a desire to say, how can we get there? We do know that a unit of blood transfused has an impact, whether it's through white cells or red cells themselves, or potentially the plasma that's being transfused with that unit of red cells, have an immune effect. Hay riesgo de infección, sobre todo en la transfusión de plaquetas, que no han podido ser minimizados a pesar de todo el cuidado que se ha tenido y todo el rigor con que se trata la sangre. Y hay riesgo en este momento de inmunomodulación, cuyo, cuya magnitud desconocemos porque probablemente eh, se van a ver a lo largo de los años, en, en años más. Scientists looked at patients that were transfused for orthopedic surgery. So they had no other comorbidities. And uh, those transfused for this particular surgeries, 10 years later, had an increased incidence of lymphoproliferative disease. They had lymphomas. The surgeons don't care what will happen 10 years later to their patient, because they're not going to see him. I think this knowledge should be given more and more to the clinicians to realize that it's not just the immediate effect that they're seeing, that there are side effects that may come along much later. That's another reason that we should be very cautious about transfusion and only use it if it's really life-saving. In America, we must make doubly sure no person is held to account for a crime he or she did not commit. So we are dramatically expanding the use of DNA evidence to prevent wrongful conviction. One of the underappreciated facts about blood transfusion is that if you get my blood, you will now have my DNA. There's some fascinating data that has come out in the last 10 years, where a group of physicians took a look back at World War II veterans who were transfused during World War II. And guess what? A significant percentage of them, over 25%, actually had DNA from a different person circulating in their body. There's been a number of studies shown that if you give a blood transfusion without reducing out the white cells, and still in the United States, 50% of our blood is given without reducing the white cells, you will become what is called a chimera. You will become a blended animal. You will no longer be a single distinct human being. You will be a multi-DNA animal carrying somebody else's DNA. How long, we don't know, but it's fascinating from the World War II group of veterans that still, some 50 years later, they still carry the DNA of the person that they were transfused from. We know today that a number of rare diseases are carried in your DNA. Your propensity for getting lymphoma, leukemia, something else, cancers may be affected by this. Your transmission of this may lead to any number of other diseases moving through a population. It's never been studied, nor do we have the foggiest notion about the effect of blood transfusion on what we call the epigenetics, the movement of these genes through a population. Unlike marriage, transfusion is for life, and there is some data showing that women who have no 
Y chromosome, since women have two Xs, any of the white cells that are detected in their bloodstream devoid of any Y chromosome, yet after being transfused for hemorrhage, uh, you can detect these Y chromosomes now because some of the units of blood they received were for male donors. You can detect these units of blood in the Y chromosome in the circulating blood of these women for years after the transfusion. We assume that because of the ability of white cells to reproduce since they have DNA, the recipient has a signature from the donor for life in their bloodstream. The clinical implications clearly are yet to be determined. Newsreel for the first time, those almost legendary figures, the Chindits. Masters in guerrilla warfare, they've taught the Japanese to fear the swift striking columns of elusive fighting men who wage war after their own fashion deep in the Burma jungle. During the war, there was a very remarkable doctor called Raphael Marcus. He was a doctor operating with what became known as the Chindits in the Burma campaign, operating behind the Japanese lines. It was a long-range group. And he found himself in the jungle treating injuries of the utmost severity with only the most basic, really basic. They, they scarcely had anesthetic. And he certainly didn't have any blood. And he learned to save lives doing surgery without blood. And when the war ended, he came back to Liverpool and he completed his formal qualifications. He's got his fellowship at the Royal College of Surgeons. And he was a pioneer of carrying out surgery without blood. Indeed, the British Medical Journal um, gave him a great tribute in his obituary that was published in that um, BMJ. In the Pacific, one of the most ubiquitous fruits out there is coconut. The Japanese discovered as a substitute for plasma infusion, coconut water. When the fruit is young, there is lots of water, uh, up to about half a liter, contained inside the coconut and sterile. One of the eyes was punctured with a sterile needle, and this water could then be infused into either an injured combatant or someone who was sick and dehydrated. A night of sustained fighting followed by thunderous artillery fire at dawn. Barrage after barrage descended on the South Ossetian capital, Skin Valley. Тоже весь мир теперь знает эту трагедию, когда 28 августа 2008 года ночью грузинская сторона начала массированный обстрел из тяжелого вооружения города Схинвал. Через нас проходили раненые, которые поступали из района боевых действий. Значит, за пять дней 212 раненых прошло. Это все тяжелые минно-осколочные ранения, это пулевые ранения. Из них примерно 50% это с тяжелой кровопотерей более 75%. Запасов крови у нас не было никаких и, крови, и, и компонентов крови. Когда мы оцениваем действия те или иные, вот в экстремальных ситуациях, то есть сколько погибло больных. Это самый главный критерий. Правильно мы оказывали помощь или неправильно. Я могу с гордостью сказать за всех своих коллег о том, что из тех, кого мы транспортировали в клинике Владикавказа, во время транспортировки ни один больной не погиб. We live in a different world today than we did 10, 15 years ago. Today, there are both many natural disasters, and then there are the man-made disasters of terrorist events. We learned from 9-11 that 
Blood is really a homeland security issue in that when 9-11 occurred, there was no movement of blood throughout the United States, and you needed to move blood throughout the United States to be able to do the HIV and hepatitis testing. So essentially, modern medical care in the United States came crashing to a halt. え、Today, we ought to really think about innovation, about ways that we can get away from this feeling of immediately triggering a transfusion whenever somebody sees red blood coming out on the floor of an operating room or an emergency room. The standard of practice are a range of therapeutic interventions that are appropriate for some medical condition or other. There's not usually not just one way in which you can treat a patient, there are several. And the great thing about the standard of practice is that they emerge typically out of a lot of thinking and a lot of experimentation. There's an evidence base backing them up. The concept of evidence-based medicine is a relatively new term in medical practice. And what it really means is that in order to ensure that the right thing is being done, there should be a basis in fact for what the therapy or the intervention is going to be. This uh, concept of tradition-based practice and evidence-based practice is, is uh, quite the rage right now in transfusion medicine for the trauma patient. I am not of the mind that in every circumstance, transfusion in trauma is beneficial. And in fact, there are data in the literature to suggest that even transfusing patients bleeding from trauma leads to adverse outcomes. When we study groups of patients that have been transfused, they have a higher incidence of such things as infections after surgery, recurrence of cancer, lung disease and lung problems. Now, it's very tempting for all of us to then say, well, so it's proven, it's a cause and effect. But just by the way that kind of medical research is done, you cannot call cause and effect. However, let me point out to you that there is a place in the world where we've made that association and we have never done controlled randomized trials, and that's smoking. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Tens of thousands of doctors in all branches of medicine in all parts of the country were asked that question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. Yes, surveys show more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Smoke Camels, the cigarette so many doctors enjoy. Does anybody watching this film have any doubt that smoking is related to lung cancer and emphysema? Yet. We've never taken two groups of patients, given them cigarettes or not, and said smoke for 50 years and let's see who comes out better. Can we give a transfusion and not hurt you? Can we do a clinical trial and demonstrate that a transfusion is no worse than not giving a transfusion? Or that you can transfuse more and not make you worse than transfuse less? No one, no one has ever said, let me give a transfusion and show that you could do better. <laughs> 
No study is designed like that. The issues we're dealing with are just, frankly, at very large, very big. And this is hard to do without being challenged. When doctors don't know whether what they're doing is harming the patient or not, okay, they have an obligation to find out. In addition, uh, there's also a common understanding of how you adjudicate, how you settle disagreements like this. How do you settle disagreements when there is what Benjamin Friedman has called clinical equipoise? Okay? That is, you've got uh, an absence of conclusive evidence showing the superiority or non-inferiority of one or another of these things. Okay? And um, you've got practical disagreement among clinicians. Okay? And yet one remains inside the standard of practice and the other is outside of it. Okay, so how do you settle it? A randomized clinical trial. Transfusion medicine suffers from not having a well-founded uh, scientific basis for the use of the therapy. And because of that, there are gaps in communication. Patients are not fully informed because there's not necessarily the information available to support the recommendation. In traditional medical schools, you would get less than a week's instruction out of a four to six year medical course on transfusion practice and transfusion medicine. Patients have the right to know a great deal of information about what's going to be done to them, what advantages that they can expect, what disadvantages might be on the horizon also, and what the alternatives are. Okay? And if the doctor isn't forthcoming in telling them that information, they have every right to ask and to expect that the doctor will recognize his or her obligation to provide that information. There is a clear legal duty on the physician um, to offer, if there are the two alternatives, one is invasive and the other is less invasive, the duty is to offer and explain and make available the less invasive alternative. The maxim is very simple, actually, it's summed up in four words. Doctors advise, patients decide. Hospital and Medical Center is celebrating a major achievement. It's been awarded a nearly $4.7 million Defense Department grant to teach military doctors what it knows about bloodless medicine and surgery. We were contacted by the special ops, both Air Force and Navy, uh, to help in terms of what they found out or knew 